Welcome to the Real Estate Raw Show, hosted by Joe Mendoza. Hi guys, Joe Mendoza here in sunny San Diego. Welcome to my show. Guys, we have an incredible guest this, uh, today, this morning, Frank Rolf, and he's from Missouri. Now, Frank has a really interesting niche. He invests primarily in mobile home parks. He also runs a commercial real estate university. He has exciting things to share. I'm excited, excited to learn about what he has to offer. So guys, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Mr. Frank Rolf. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. All right, great. And check this out, ladies and gentlemen. He went to Stanford University, one of the most prestigious universities here in the nation, and he graduated in three years. So that's got to tell you a little bit something about what's going to be offered on this show. So again, Frank, for our audience, maybe catch them up to speed. Tell a little bit who you are. Absolutely, uh, Joe. I, uh, as you say, went to Stanford. I got out in three years. I was going to go to business school. So back then, uh, we're talking in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, to go to business school, you would traditionally start a business as part of your application process. And you write that as your essay. It would be an essay on, you know, current trends in your life. And you wanted to put in there, you started a business. So uh, I asked people, what should I start for a year? Uh, because I had a year to kill. because I was a year ahead of the rest of my class. And they said, oh, they had all kinds of different stupid ideas, open a sandwich shop, stuff like that. One guy said, you ought to try building billboards. So I started building billboards. And then I never went to business school. I just kept building the billboards. Uh, got to be the largest private owner of billboards in Dallas, Fort Worth, just through working 24 hours a day. Uh, then I sold that to a public company in 96, started buying mobile home parks. And uh, today, myself, my partner, Dave Reynolds, we're, we're the fifth largest mobile home park owners in the U.S., although I think this year we're going to drop to sixth largest because uh, there's a public reap will overtake us. But uh, that's, that's basically the story. We just don't operate good old American trailer parks. Wow, that's great, Frank. So from billboards to mobile home parks, did you just jump right in or did you try some single family flips or retail, office? What, did, what kind of got you into that? Yeah, I looked at all that stuff, right? So I would sold the billboard company. And so I had capital from the sale. I was trying to figure out what, what next to get involved in. And I've always liked things that I felt like were on the cutting edge uh, as far as the cycle of the industry. So I called a lot of people I built billboards on. I built billboards on 300 different people's property. And uh, so one guy I talked to uh, said on that one call, if you're interested in mobile home parks, I'll go ahead and sell you mine right now. Uh, for $400,000 with $10,000 down and I'll carry $390,000 for 30 years. So that's how I got in. It was, he made me an offer. I couldn't refuse. I didn't know anything about the industry at all. Uh, once I got into the industry, I liked the fact that nobody else was interested in it. And it, it was in the affordable housing sector. And I really was interested in the fact that it's been uh, basically outlawed as far as building new ones for about half a century. So I thought if, if you can't build them, uh, then I know this, these, through supply and demand alone, the values will go up. So I bought one, then I bought another, then another, then another. It just kept growing from there. Now, it sounds like by accident that you got in then, basically, right? By accident. The only, wow. the only fact I knew when I agreed to buy that guy's mobile home park right there on the phone was that when I was building billboards, billboards are federally, federally regulated. And so the, you can only build them in certain zonings. And I noticed when I, when I was scouring zoning maps for decades that you, you never saw mobile home zoning. It's a, in Dallas, it was an MH zoning. And it was so rare. It was the rarest of all zonings. So uh, I, I already knew there was something up as far as supply and demand of parks. Didn't really know a whole lot beyond that, just that there were very few zone tracks. And so, but that's, that's how I got in. Wow, that's awesome. Talk about being at the right place at the right time. <laughs> now, these other mobile home parks that you started to buy, did you understand seller financing? Because this was offered to you and you jumped right on. How did that all work out? I jumped right on because I'd never seen seller financing before. In the billboard space, uh, it's all done with either cash or bank debt. Never, no one ever seller carried ever. So I, when I, that, that again, I probably was more interested in the financing arrangement than the mobile home park, to be honest with you. 
because I'd never heard of a seller carrying paper of loan process that did not require going before a banking committee or having any any credit checks or anything. Just this, just this this wild potential of someone being able to write their own mortgage to me seemed kind of kind of odd. Uh, so I thought I had nothing more to lose than ten thousand dollars. If I hated it, I'd give it back to them. It's all non recourse. If I liked it, I keep going. So that's that's but that's how I got into it. Wow, that's awesome, Frank. Now, there's some people in my audience does not understand seller financing. I've been in real estate almost three decades and I'm starting to see this is probably the right time again to start out working out creative strategies on uh, seller financing. Could you kind of share a little bit to my audience who might not know what that means? Sure. So seller financing, what it is, is you have you know, typically a mom and pop seller which would be defined as someone who's fairly unsophisticated and typically older in age. They're trying to cash out of their asset. And a lot of mobile home parks are built by people who were uh, folks who had normal day jobs. The guy might be a postman, he might have owned a subway sandwich shop, whatever. Uh, so it's a fairly big asset to them. And so if they, if they sell it for cash, let's just do a model. Let's just say you sold a mobile home park for a uh, million dollars in cash. The, the mom and pop would have to pay income tax on that. So let's say that between federal and state and recapture and everything else, let's just say they spend 30% in tax. So then they have $700,000 and they go down to their local stockbroker place like AG Edwards and they say, I've got $700,000 to invest. They say, how, how, risk, how risky will you go? They say, not risky at all. They say, well, I, I've got something here that will pay out 2%. So their seven hundred thousand dollars ends up at fourteen thousand a year. So basically, they got a million in cash, and all they get is fourteen thousand a year. Uh, if you carry, the way it works is you only pay tax on the money as you receive it. So let's say you put twenty percent down. So you give them two hundred thousand dollars in cash down, and let's just assume they squander that, burn it. It doesn't even matter to the story. They have an eight hundred thousand dollar note, and right now let's say you pay five percent, they get forty thousand a year. So they're getting basically three times more money a year by carrying than they did by through cash. And that's really the key motivating factor is simply money because you can pay so much more interest on a seller note than they can get themselves in the in, in that in the public marketplace. So that's that's one of their primary reasons. Another reason people do this stuff is that they uh, there's a thing called bonding where you have people who just like each other, so therefore they try to help them. Uh, old moms and pops know new entrants in the industry might have trouble getting a loan. So they say, oh, screw it. We don't need a bank anyway. I'll just carry it. And then the third reason they do it is if the deal won't pass muster with the bank, which is probably going back to the first deal I did, why he did it that way. Because the thing was losing two grand a month. So basically, if we were to go out and get an appraisal, I don't know if it would appraise for 400000 at that moment in history because it was actually losing money. Uh, but th that's what seller financing is. It's... Uh, it's low interest rate, typically long-term, fixed rate, non-recourse. So it probably is just about the best financing you can get. I totally agree. I totally, totally agree. Especially now where banks are having trouble or being more conservative on how they're lending to people. So great, great, great tip. Uh, now you said something earlier that was pretty interesting as well. Now, there's a lot of land out there, California, I'm in California, Texas, they have a lot of land, but you said there's pretty much a, a halt or a stop on building mobile home parks. Why is that? Yeah, well, what happened was, you know, the industry used to be very, very high highfalutin back in the 50s and the 60s. Elvis Presley was living in mobile home parks in two of his movies. He actually also owned a mobile home park that he built himself near Graceland that he lived in. Uh, it was a vacation retreat. But uh, in modern times, we all know that mobile home parks are all about affordable housing. So what happened is back in about the 70s, city fathers realized that uh, these mobile home parks were kind of a bad idea for their city. And it wasn't because of the demographics, it was because of the economics. So uh, for example, if you take a mobile home park that we used to own here in Missouri, uh, just up the highway from where I am, about 150 lots right across from the school district, Probably everybody in that entire mobile home park has at least one kid. And so each kid is costing the city about $8,000 a year in tuition. However, they don't get much property tax because the mobile home park, each, each plot of land is worth about 40 grand per space. 
and each mobile home was worth about 5,000. They're all older. And Missouri is a 1% state. So they're only getting 450 of tax per space, but they're spending probably $8,000 in taxpayer money per space. So if you add it all together, that one mobile home park is costing the city probably about a million dollars a year. Wow. So all the other things you can do with property, there's nothing that can lose money like that. Office buildings make money for the city. Retail centers make money twice, property tax and sales tax. Nothing you can come up with. Self-storage, it doesn't matter. Nothing loses money for cities like mobile home parks. I see. So, don't want them. So, but they can't legally say I don't want them because they lose money because that's against the law under the Congress's duty to serve act. So they have an easier way to get out. What they do is they just make sure that every resident knows what a park might be built or expanded that that's on the table, then they will all show up to city council meetings in, in force to say they don't want it in their neighborhood, and they'll shoot it down saying, you know, we really like affordable housing, but yet, you know, the people have spoken, they don't want the mobile home park near their homes, and they turn them down. So it's, it's, it's a fantastic game they've invented, and there's really no way around it. Uh, it is factually true that if you have a mobile home park next to single-family homes, the ones nearest the park are reduced in value significantly, sometimes as much as 50% of those not next to the mobile home park. So it does have detrimental effect on property values, scientifically proven. So no one's ever going to want one next to their house. So therefore, the idea of developing them, developing them is about zero. So what do people do who just uh, dying to develop is they, they go out in rural areas where there's no city council, where there's only county, where there's no zoning sometimes. But the problem when you build those are there's no city water or city sewer. So you have to build very expensive private utilities. And then when you get done, no one wants to live there because you're too far in the middle of nowhere. So there, the, the supply has really been capped since about the 70s. The estimate there's about 10 per year built in the entire United States. There's about 100 per year torn down in the United States. So it's actually an endangered species. It's shrinking as we speak. Wow, that's interesting. Now, I work with a lot of investors. Sometimes they invest in my stuff. Sometimes they do their own thing and I consult with them. Now, California has always kind of, kind of um, brought on a small, small cap rate, you know, uh, a return on somebody's investment. Now, other states that I'm seeing a pretty high cap rate What's your kind of thoughts or recommendations on where to invest on a mobile home park? Well, you're correct that you know, California has been a wonderful market for mobile home parks. It's the uh, second largest number of them in the United States. The problem you have in California is things are so valuable. Parks are typically evaluated not as mobile home parks, but as land. So people will say, here, buy my mobile home park and you can tear it down and build something. Or buy my mobile home park and you can warehouse the land for a decade and then tear it down. So the cap rates are very low because they don't tie the value just to the park. They tie the value to the land value. And that's not income-based. That's more speculation. So, yeah, we, we, we prefer more what they call the flyover states, the middle of the U.S. We, we are the Great Plains in the Midwest. But people own and operate parks all over the U.S. And, and it does well. The business model works everywhere fairly well. Uh, but if you were in California looking to buy a mobile home park, you might find one. You'd have to, you'd have to get way off the coast. You're not going to find one for sale reasonably in Los Angeles or San Diego. Uh, but I do get calls from people who are buying parks in, in more eastern parts of, of California. But even a lot of Californians typically will not buy in California in mobile home parks. They'll, they'll buy mobile home parks in such states as Colorado and uh, Texas and, you know, the, all those states, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, the, the, the heart of America. That's uh, for this niche of real estate, that's where the bulk of it is to be found. There's about 44,000 parks and only about uh, maybe maybe one to 2,000 of those are in California. So the, the bulk of the industry is not in California. So if somebody were to jump in now, because I'm even seeing some smaller parks, like somebody was sharing something like a an eight unit or an eight lot mobile home park, uh, I saw a 28 unit recently. I'm looking at an 81 right now. Um, what are some of the things to look out for when they're kind of doing their due diligence? Sure. Yeah, there, there's five factors that make a mobile home park work, and they spell out to the word ideal, which stands for infrastructure, density, economics, the age of homes, and location. Uh, 
the all, all five of those are extremely important as far as your deal working out. Uh, on the infrastructure side, you got to make sure you have good, solid working water, sewer, roads, parking system. So infrastructure stands for all the stuff you, you can see or that's slightly beneath the earth. Uh, the density, the problem you have with mobile home parks are based on vintage. Some of them will not fit modern trailers on. So mod modern, the smallest modern two bedroom, one bath that exists is about a 14 by 46 foot. Uh, some of the parks will not hold a 14 by 46 foot. In that case, you're too dense and it's no longer really a mobile home park. It's more of an RV park. Uh, the economics are correct. The, our cap rates are, I believe, the highest in the real estate sector today. So uh, normally we're trying to buy parks that have a minimum of a three-point spread between the interest rate and the cap rate, which is doable in our industry. Because if you're borrowing at 5%, you have to buy at an 8% cap rate or better. Uh, the age of homes is important because we like to have all our owners be, being owners. We like them to be a stakeholder in the business. We don't want them to have any mortgages. So typically, all mobile homes up through the late 1990s are paid for. Uh, so we like to see a mixture of paid for, but we, yeah, we like to see a few newer ones to let people know that it's still acceptable and desirable for new homes. And then on the location, there's basically two locations that work. There's that upscale suburban location. And then there's that real gritty urban location. So that, that's kind of what people are looking for in a nutshell. You're just looking for stuff that's institutional quality that banks love and that people will buy from you. Awesome. That's great information. Now, going back to the cap rate, you're looking for a, like a 3% spread on what the cost of money is. And now you're saying about like the actuals. So let's just say interest rates are 5%. Let's just be kind of conservative. And you're seeing the actuals performing at an 8%. That's kind of a good standard. Yeah, the, sta the standard you're looking for is three points above the, above the interest rate with the ability to grow that. And the way we grow that normally is by raising rents, by filling lots, and by pushing water sewer back on the residents and by cutting costs. And uh, our industry, the average rent is about 280 a month, they estimate. And the rents need to be more like 500. So there's plenty of room to push them in most markets. Now, California is uniquely different. Their California lot rents are as much as 2,500 a month. Right. Uh, rest of America, the norm is about 280, but already in many states, the rents are coming closer to 500 as people are catching on to the fact that rents are ridiculously low. Wow, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now, some of these mobile home parks have a mix where the park actually owns the the uh, mobile home and then some of them um, the owners that are renting own the 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 mobile home um, they go in there almost blind right they don't know what they're getting what are some of your suggestions on like uh, do you should you take over all the ownership or give them all away to where you're just renting the dirt basically the mobile home park industry has always functioned as a as a as a land business so we're, 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 our permits are defined as a parking lot. So I want to want to own the parking lot. I don't want to own the cars in the parking lot. So whenever we buy a park that has park on homes in it, our primary goal is to get them out the door because I just want to charge my monthly parking lot rent. I mean, you just see the two business models don't have anything in common with each other. One is very low management, low stress, and the other is hugely high management, repair and maintenance, constant turnover so yeah we just want to be a parking lot got it perfect <laughs> now you know as i mentioned i'm looking at a variety right now but here i am in california hundreds of thousands of miles away from some of these parks you know what do you kind of look for in management um is there a certain fee that you want or um, a minimum standard of lots, or what's kind of like the formula to look out for? Like, hey, you know what? You're in California. Minimum you should buy is at least 30 because it makes sense. Because if you go under that, it, the, the numbers just don't click. They don't yeah. pan out at all. The, the minimum you should try to buy, unless you can find something in your backyard, is about with something with a two on the front, like 25, 28, something like that. But it's not because of management, because we you can manage the – parks fairly simply, which I'll go over in a second, but the reason you want at least 25 lots or more is that lending dries up when your lending gets much below 750 grand as far as the note. 
So if you have a 25 space park that you can fill, the value at the end would be probably around a million dollars or more. And that puts you right where you want to be for banking. Uh, so it's not really a management driven issue, it's banking. If you have buy a 10 space park for over 250 grand, banks don't want to do loans on things like that because if, you, if your loan's only that big, they can just do a single family home. And then they don't have any of the stigma about mobile home parks or learning about them or anything. So it's really hard to get small loans. When you get bigger, then the bank may say, well, you know what? I could do a $750,000 single family loan, but you know, those can be a little risky or my market doesn't really qualify for homes that expensive. And then the park looks more attractive. The other thing is the parks typically offer daily deposits, DDAs, 25 space park. You've got enough DDA to be interesting to somebody. Right now you're bringing in $6,000 a month, $10,000 a month. That's interesting to a bank. But if you're only bringing in $2,000 a month in DDAs, once again, the bank will say, I, that's what the rent of the, mobile, of the actual house would be. So back to stick build housing again. So that, that's, the, that's, that's the issue on size. Awesome. On man, I, the, uh, the typical going rate in the park is $10 per month per lot is what you pay your manager. So on a 25 space park, you pay about 250 a month to the manager, the manager would be somebody who already lived in it. And so you don't, you're not gonna import a manager until the park is at least 100 spaces or more. And uh, all that person is gonna do is basically just be like your little ambassador to the park. They're gonna collect, it'll be the point of collection of the money. People will put it through their door in a mail slot. And if you ever have a problem, they'd be there to tell you the power went out or there's a big rain or whatever. But the duties are few and far between. So the, managing the parks, as long as you are in the land perspective, is very easy. Now, if you have a lot of park-owned homes, much more complicated. You have to make repairs, show homes, run ads, all that kind of stuff. But if it's just the standard parking lot, that it's not that it's not hard to manage. Wow, that's great information. Now, going to financing, uh, what are you kind of seeing right now? Is it like a twenty-five percent down, thirty percent down? What are banks kind of looking for right now if they're well, buying 20, 20 lots or more? Let's just break it down into the different sectors of financing that you have out there. You know, you've got seller financing, which should be everyone's favorite. Uh, you can go all the way down to zero down. We've we've done twelve zero down deals over the last twenty-five years. Wow. So, Zero, I've seen five, I've seen 10. My first deal was 3%. Uh, there's no banking regulations for moms and pops. So why would they go lower? They'll go lower for your various reasons. One thing is economically, every dollar that they don't take in a down payment, they don't pay in tax and they get it at whatever your, your interest rate is, let's say 5%. So the down payment really is only there to give them some degree of comfort you have skin in the game. And they all have different ideas of how much they need to feel comfortable. Some may say, I need 20%. I've never seen more than 20% on a seller note. It's possible it could be, but it's typically 20% 20, 20 and under. Uh, if you're gonna do bank financing, now you're talking about 20% typically with smaller banks to as much as 30% with bigger banks. And then there's two other types of part financing. One is called conduit, CMBS debt. That's for loans that are at least a million dollars or more. Those are 70% loan to value. So it's 70% of what your appraisal comes in at, but it's not based on what you're paying. So if your appraisal comes in high, you can theoretically come in at less than 30% down. And then the exact wow. same for, for Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, what they now call agency debt. So <laughs> That's right. amazing. Guys, I hope you're paying attention because uh, Frank is dropping some really amazing golden nuggets here. So you said you had about a dozen at zero down? Yeah, a dozen at zero down. The way the zero down deals that we've done have worked are, number one, you bond with the seller. So the seller likes you, trusts you. That's how they get over the obstacle of how much down they need because they realize that you're a good person and not going to walk off and abandon them. And then what you do is you spin it that you need to use your down payment to make capital improvements, right? So you say gee, mom and pop, you know, the park needs, needs a lot of TLC. So how about I put my down payment into that? And that way your collateral will be more valuable. So if I died tomorrow, the park is worth more. But to do a truly zero down, see there's fake zero down and there's real zero down. A fake zero down deal, which I'm not including in the, in the number 12. A fake zero down is where you say, okay, but then the amount of capital it needs is 20% down, right? Okay, the, the ones that, that 
the heart of the good ones or where it doesn't need a lot of capital. It just looks really bad. So for example, we bought a park once that, that uh, it was a mom and pop. Pop had had a stroke. Mom didn't know what she was doing. So she basically stopped mowing the park. That was one of the biggest problems. She had abandoned mowing for two years. So she was letting all the grass free grow. So the only thing that was mowed were the tenants' lots, but the entry, all the common areas, all the vacant lots, the grass was as high as it will grow naturally in nature. So it was like about four or five feet high. And then the grass started growing into the streets because it just is like trying to get new territory. So it all started growing and extending. So the streets looked like the streets were made of grass. So we said to mom and pop man or, or mom, this park looks just terrible. And she's like, I know it's just, it's an embarrassment. So I'll tell you what, just put your down payment into bringing it back to life. But all it really needed was mowing, right? Mowing is not that expensive. So right. we had a guy hog and then with a the mower and an edger and got all that done. But that's the good zero down deals. The good zero down deals, typically mom and pop overreact as to how bad it is. And they don't realize that, that not all repairs are capital intensive. Wow, that's incredible. Man, if we had more time on the show, we could probably talk about all those dozens of stories. But I'm sure, you know, you run that university, they should just attend that university training or boot camp. That's exciting. So um, a lot of the folks out there, they go to all the other trainings and boot camps and schools, the fix and flips, what have you, and they're teaching hey, send out your yellow letters, put out these band sides. That's how you're going to drum up business. Is it the same as far as mobile home parks to get leads? Yeah, no, it's nothing like that. The way, well, maybe it's a little bit like that. Uh, the key ways you're going to get a mobile home park, number one is with a broker. So about of all the deals we've done, about half have been with brokers. It's a very specialized broker being a mobile home park broker. Uh, there are lists of them you can find on websites like Mobile Home Park Store, um, but, but that's one way. Another way is online because there's, a, there's typically a thousand mobile home parks, excuse me, for sale at any given moment on either mobilehomeparkstore.com or loopnet.com. Uh, and then the other ways we do it are we do direct mail pieces to the park owners. We do cold calling to park owners. Well, even if the park owner won't respond to a cold call or direct mail, uh, we'll sometimes even drop by their houses. But that, that, those are typically the five ways you find them. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Now, I love it. You said broker. I am a broker. So, guys, <laughs> if you need one. <laughs> All right. So, the other website you mentioned now is that I saw it on your website. Do you also own that one? Uh, mobile home park store has been around longer than any other mobile home park website. That's owned, but not by me, but by my partner, Dave. He, uh, he started it back when the internet began. He bought the uh, domain from a minister for a thousand dollars. Uh, no one knows why the minister had it. I guess he was speculating on domain names and, uh, that has become a repository where a lot of mom and pops go and list their parks for sale. So that, that and LoopNet are the two big ones in the U S. Awesome. Awesome. That's great information. Thank you so much. Now, um, wow. Tell us a little bit more about your university and why people should attend or buy your courses. Sure. Uh, what happened was back when Dave and I were, you know, starting out and buying mobile home parks, there was almost nobody in America who was doing that. That's taught back in the mid nineties. And it was considered such an odd sector of real estate that there were no books on it. There was nothing on it. The last book published on the industry when we got into it was in 1905. So Dave and I, uh, almost as therapy, wondered if there was anyone else out there who gave a darn would start writing small books and we would put them on his, his website, Mobile Home Park Store. So I would write little books, typically humor books. Like my first book was called I'm With Stupid, 50 Stories from a Trailer Park. It was the 50 dumbest things I'd ever seen residents do. And then Dave's first book was on accounting, basic accounting for mobile home parks. And as we would write these little books, people would like them. They'd ask for more little books. Over time, we compiled the little books into what we called the home study course. And then the home study course grew into the boot camp. But it's all been grown organically because uh, it is just a hobby. 
So what makes our boot camp different, I guess, is it's just straight up information because we don't sell anything. We don't do any coaching or mentoring. We don't sell any deals. We, it's like a college class. So we kind of designed it to be like a Stanford real estate class on mobile home park, which does not actually exist, but it, it's, it's, it's like that. So it's, it's kind of different for most people. It's a lot of information. We do it both classroom and we go out and walk mobile home parks for a day and evaluate them on site. So it's all, it's all geared, geared towards basically just the factual way the industry runs and all the different formulas and stuff that no one's ever heard of because there's no high school or college class on parks. So that's, that's kind of how it works. Got it. So somebody has to have the patience, the discipline to really like sit down and flip through the online training, what have you. Um, so you're not offering mentorship or coaching or anything like that right now? We do. We do in a very loose way. I do, I do weekly. I do uh, weekly. I do two calls a week that are both one hour Q&A calls. But we don't, we don't really call it coaching or mentoring. It's basically just a way for people to ask questions as they go through material. I mean, our, our thought is basically people, you know, learn about the industry, jump in there, start looking at deals, making offers, then different questions pop up. So we, we, it's kind of a support, kind of a support network. It's just not your traditional coaching. Awesome. Now, if somebody saw this video, got really fired up and excited, has no money, no credit, no creativity, they wanted a mentor would they be able to reach out, maybe do a JV with you, or how would you kind of bet them out to see if, like, you know what, I want to help out this fella? Bigger than the normal group because we're, we're we're the fifth largest donor in the U.S., so we can't do JVs and things with people. It's not allowed under our 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 day job items. Uh, but I'm always more than help, happy to help people. It's kind of like the old car talk show on PBS. I don't know if you ever saw saw car talk. But Car Talk was a hugely popular show back in the 70s and the 80s in which these two guys in a car garage, people would call up and tell them what was wrong with their car. And they would tell them either how to fix it or what they thought it would cost to fix. So it was just, it was just fact-based, giving people information that they needed. And that's kind of what I do. So I'm kind of like a, like a recreation of Car Talk for mobile home parts. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Oh, one last question is about the numbers. Now, what, if somebody's running their numbers, they're, they're trying to figure out the cash-on-cash uh, cash returns, you know, they're all looking through the NOI and what have you, what kind of typical operating expenses is kind of like the norm on a park? That's, that's easy. It, uh, it's basically, there's two numbers. If the residents pay their own water and sewer, it's a 30% expense ratio. And if the residents don't pay their own water and sewer, it's a 40% expense ratio. So basically 10% of your gross typically goes to water sewer. That's but it. That's the whole formula. That's what everyone. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's great. That's great. That is pretty simple. All right. So Frank, anything else you would like to share with my audience? Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's worthy of spending some time to look at the mobile home park sector if you have not done it in the past. I mean, I, I had nothing but a negative stigma against it when I bought my first park back in 96. I, I, I thought it, it was just a bastion of weirdos and crime and poor people. And I've learned over the years that that stigma I had, that's created by the media, but that isn't actually what's going on. So if you haven't ever been in a mobile home park and you're listening to this and you say, nah, mobile home parks, that's gross. Just Drive through one sometime. Just Google up mobile home parks in your area. Drive a few. Don't drive just the worst one. Every city has that one terrible park that's on a well and a septic and it's all failing and the people are crazy and there's no skirting and it's just like straight out of the eight mile movie. Sure, those do exist, but that's not really the industry. The industry is much, much nicer, much cleaner. Uh, you know, just, just if you haven't looked at one, go look at one when you're driving around read up on it a bit. I mean, a lot of people miss the opportunity because of this, this ridiculous U.S. media hatred of the industry. But I wish I had the photos I could show you. But for example, a lot of people, their whole idea of mobile home park stems from the movie Eight Mile with Eminem, right? So anyone who's seen that movie says, oh my God, trailer park, I would never survive that. So I was out, we owned some parks in Michigan. One time I thought for fun, I'll head over to Detroit and I'll just pull in Eminem's old mobile home park, right? Because I <laughs> On Google, so there was the address of his mobile home park. I pull into the thing. It's an old retirement community. 
So the whole movie's a fraud. That part's a fraud. I think Eminem would admit it if he was here. Uh, he, he grew up in a mobile home park that's actually fairly decent, fairly nice. It has a clubhouse. It has a pool. The average resident I saw in there was probably uh, a, a, a senior. Uh, I even went to the lot that they claimed on Google was the one he lived in. It, it was a perfectly nice looking mobile home with skirting and shutters and <laughs> sidewalk. But of course, that doesn't make you sound gritty if you want to be a rapper. It would be not good for your career to say, yeah, I grew up in a, in a retirement mobile home park. <laughs> right. Invented <laughs> that thing in the movie, but that's, that's how the media always has portrayed it. It's just a invention and it's not real. So if you have the same stigma issue that I had, uh, to break out of the stigma to see if it might work for you, you owe it to yourself to at least go drive through one and see if it lives up to the stereotypes. I guarantee you it's not going to. It's, it's uh, it's basically just, it's a highly dense form of detached housing. It's all that it is. It's not, it's not, it's not a weird thing. It's not a dangerous thing. It's just like if you took a typical subdivision of stick built homes and you, and you shrunk it down. So the lots were much, much smaller. The homes are a little smaller. That's all it is. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Frank. I mean, people have just got to learn, like I say, before they earn. And guys, keep subscribing, keep listening to the incredible folks and guests that are coming on my show. Frank, I mean, holy smoke, check out his resume. I was very impressed with your resume. And, and number two, my kids, one of their schools of choice, hopefully in the future, is Stanford. So I was like excited about that. So, <laughs> when computers were using punch cards and there was no Google, okay? So <laughs> back, back when I went there. Back when I went there, you know, the most the most famous person on campus was John Elway and Tiger Woods. It was all sports. It was a sports school back in that era. And today it's obviously very, very strong science and math and, and internet place. But back, back then, to be honest with you, most people knew of Stanford because it just had so many celebrity sports people. Nice, nice. Were any of them your friends? Uh, John Elway was in my dorm. Uh, Bill Walton would commonly play basketball in a court out in front of the dorm. Nice. Uh, yeah, John McEnroe had just gra graduated. So I was there uh, kind of in the heyday of that. But no, the only, the only sports person of today that I know who would not even know me in a million years was Elway. Because he was not only in my dorm, he was also an economics major. So he was in my economics classes. But it's probably the only household name that exists anymore. That's great. <laughs> That's awesome. Best way to get a hold of you? Oh, uh, mhu.com. You just go to the mhu.com. That's probably, that's our hobby hobby website there. I'm all over the darn thing. So if you go if you on there, you can't you can't not find me. I am I am mhu.com. A million a million words and over 500 hours of videos and audios on there. So it's, Wow, it's, that's it's, great. That's great. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks so much for your time. Guys, Please watch, subscribe, listen, learn before you earn. Like Frank said, I mean, when I was in, in college myself, I was coaching baseball um, for my brother. And one of the nicest kids on a team, we dropped him off at his uh, mobile home. And, and he was very polite. They're people, guys. So get your education, learn about investing, you know, and learn about mobile home parks. I mean, this is incredible. I think you're, this is a very, very great opportunity. Thanks so much, Frank. Bet. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Our company is not responsible for the success or failure of your business decisions relating to any information presented by our company or our company programs, products, and or services.